Good morning, fifth graders. It's Mrs. Utsi ready to read to you another chapter of the Watsons Go to Birmingham. We are ready for chapter nine today. And if you remember where we left off with chapter eight, if we're starting to get really good, uh, Byron ended up getting in some trouble. He was being Byron. And his parents are really fed up with his ways and the things that he does. So they have been threatening all this time and forever to send him with his grandmother in Birmingham, Alabama. And it looks like that is what is about to happen next. Looks like that may be a consequence for his actions. So let's dive into chapter nine and see what happens next. And chapter nine is actually titled The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. So this is all taking place in 1963. That Sunday, I got up early. There weren't any cartoons on then, but it was always fun to wake up and not have to worry about going to school. When I got into the living room, I was surprised to see the front door open. I looked outside and saw dad sitting in the brown bomber. I guess he was listening to records because he had his arm across the seat and was beating his hand up and down like it was a drum. I ran back upstairs to the bedroom and changed out of my pajamas. I peeked out of the bedroom window to make sure dad hadn't left. He was still in the car, so I ran downstairs and through the front door. I remembered and caught the screen just before it slammed. I tapped on the window and dad turned and smiled at me, then pointed to the passenger side for me to get in. I ran around the car and climbed in. Hey, Kenny. Hi, dad. How'd you sleep? Okay, I guess. Go on in and get yakety yak and sit with me for a while. That's okay. I'll just listen to what you're playing. We listened to a couple of jive songs and then I said, dad, does Byron really have to go to Alabama? Couldn't we just drive down to about Ohio and pretend we're going to leave him to scare him? Dad looked at me and smiled kind of slow. He reached over and turned the ultra glide down a little bit. Kenneth, I know you're going to miss Byron. We all will. But son, there are some things that Byron has to learn and he's not learning them in Flint. And the things he is learning are things we don't want him to. Do you understand? No. Dad turned the ultra glide down a little more. He looked like he was thinking whether or not he should tell me something. He was looking straight at me, and even though it was real hard, I looked right back at him. I tried to look real intelligent, and I guess it worked, because finally Dad said, Kenny, we've put a lot of thought into this. I know you've seen on the news what's happening in some parts of the South, right? We've seen the pictures of a bunch of really mad white people with twisted up faces, screaming and giving dirty finger signs to some little Negro kids who are trying to go to school. I've seen the pictures, but I didn't really know how these white people could hate some kids so much. I've seen it. I didn't have to tell dad I didn't understand. Well, a lot of times that's going to be the way of the world for you kids. Byron is getting old enough to have to understand that his time for playing is running out fast. He's got to realize the world doesn't have a lot of jokes waiting for him. He's got to be ready. Dad looked at me again to make sure I was understanding. I nodded. Grandma Sam says it's quiet down where they are, but we think it's time Byron got an idea of the kind of place the world can be. And maybe spending some time down south will help open his eyes. I nodded my head again. Mama and I are very worried because there's so many things that can go wrong to a young person, and Byron seems bound and determined to find every one of them. Now, do you really understand why we're sending Byron to Birmingham? I think so, Dad. Good, because Kenny, we've done all we can, and it seems the temptations are just too much for Bye here in Flint. So hopefully, the slower pace in Alabama will help him by removing some of those temptations. Hopefully, he can see that there comes a time to let all of the silliness go. Bye, I'll be back. Maybe at the end of the summer. Maybe next year. It's completely in his own hands now. I love when Dad talks to me like I was a grown-up. I didn't really understand half the junk he was saying, but it sure did feel good to be talked to like that. It's times like this when someone is talking to you like you're a grown-up that you have to be careful not to pick your nose or dig your drawers out of your butt. Okay, Dad, thanks. He smiled again, turned the ultra glide back up, and read his hand over his head. 
Some of the time when you think about being a grown up, it gets to be kind of scary. I couldn't figure out how mama and dad knew how to take care of things. I couldn't figure out how they knew what to do with Byron. Dad? Hmm? I don't think I'll ever know what to do when I'm a grown up. It seems like you and mama know a lot of things that I could never learn. It seems real scary. I don't think I could ever be as good a parent as you guys. Dad turned the ultra glide back down. Kenny, do you remember when we used to go on drives and I'd put you in my lap and let you steer the car? I smiled. Yeah, does that mean I get to do it on the way to Alabama? Sure, but that's not what I meant. Do you remember how big and scary the car seemed to be the first time you were behind the wheel? Dad was right. Even though I knew he was watching everything real close, it still was scary to steer the brown bomber. Well, that's what being a grown-up is like. At first, it's scary, but then before you realize, with a lot of practice, you have it under control. Hopefully, you'll have lots of time to practice being grown up before you actually have to do it. This was making sense to me. And as far as you being a good parent, don't worry. You'll learn from the mistakes your mother and I make, just like we learn from the, sp- the mistakes our parents made. I don't have a single doubt that you and Byron and Joey will be much better parents than your mother and I ever were. Dad stopped talking for a second. Besides, some of the time we don't think we've done such a good job. But you're right, Kenneth. It can be scary, and it gets a lot scarier when you see you're responsible for three little lives. A lot scarier. I waited to see if dad was going to talk to me like this anymore, but he turned the music back up. We listened to his junk a little more, and then I said, Dad? Yeah? I've got one more question. He turned the ultra glide down a little again and gave me his serious look. What do you want to know, Kenny? Is it too late to go get Yakety Yak? Dad laughed and sent me in to get it. I had to promise to play it only three times, though. After the third time, I asked, Dad, why did you buy this record player? Don't they have radio stations in Alabama? Sure they do. Lots of them. But you see, once you get south of Cincinnati, the only kind of radio station you can get is hillbilly music. And you won't believe this, but if you listen to any kind of music long enough, first you get accustomed to it, and then you learn to like it. Now, your mother and I made a deal when we first got married that if either one of us ever watched the wonderful, wonderful Lawrence Welk show or listened to country music, the other one got to get a free divorce. I'm kind of used to your mother, and I don't want to have her dump me. So instead of taking the chance, I would get hooked on hillbilly music. I thought it would be wise to bring our own sounds along with us. Even though this made sense to me, Mama didn't buy it. And for the next week, while we were getting everything set for going to Alabama, she kept reminding Dad how much the Ultra Glide cost and how it messed up all the plans she'd written in her notebook. Me and Joy were in the living room playing when Mama and our neighbor, Mrs. Davison, came in. Hello, Joetta. Hello, Kenneth. Hi, Mrs. Davison. I noticed right away that she had something behind her back. She said, Since I won't be seeing you for a while, I thought I'd give you something so you wouldn't forget about me, sweetheart. She stuck a box out toward Joey. I could kill Joey the way she opened presents. Instead of ripping the wrapping paper off, she hunted around to find each piece of tape, then peeled it off real careful. It took her about two days to get all the paper off and open the box. Joey finally held up her present. I didn't think Mrs. Davidson noticed, but I could tell there was something that Joey wasn't too happy about. She looked at Mama real quick, and Mama looked at her. Then Joey said, Thank you very much, Mrs. Davison. Mama smiled. Mrs. Davison took the present from Joey and handed it to Mama. See, Walona, it's just like I told you. Look at that smile. The minute I saw it reminded me of Joetta. Is that her smile or what? In fact, do you know what I named this angel? Joey pretended she was stupid and said, No, Mrs. Davison. I've named her after my favorite little girl. This angel's name is Joetta. I went over for a closer look. Mrs. Davison had brought Joey a little angel that was kind of chubby and had big wings and a halo made out of straw. The only thing about its smile that looked like Joey to me was that the angel had a great big dimple too. It was made out of white clay and it looked like someone had forgotten to paint it. 
The only thing that had any color on it were its cheeks and its eyes. The cheeks were red and the eyes were blue. Mrs. Davidson said, Oh, child, give me one more big hug before I go. Joey got up and hugged Mrs. Davidson, then took her angel and said, I'm going to put her in my room. Thank you, Mrs. Davidson. You're welcome, precious. Mrs. Davidson looked like she was going to cry. We all knew she'd kidnap Joey if she had the chance. She liked her that much. When Mrs. Davidson left, Mama went upstairs and into Joey's room. I eavesdropped. They were both sitting on Joey's bed. I was very proud of the way you behaved, Joetta. What was wrong? That angel, Mommy. Oh. Mrs. Davidson said it reminded her of me, but it didn't look like me at all. Mama looked around the room. Where'd you put it? It's in my socks drawer. Joy was so neat, she had a separate drawer for socks. Mama went and got the angel and sat next to Joey. Sweetheart, I can see how it reminds her of you. Look at that dimple. But mommy, it's white. Mama laughed. Well, honey, I can't say it isn't, but an angel's an angel. What do you think? Maybe, but I know that angel's name isn't Joetta Watson. Well, I'm glad you didn't hurt Mrs. Davison's feelings. Keep the angel around. You might get to like it. Where do you want me to put it? Back under the socks? Mama laughed. The only one who didn't do anything to get ready to go to Alabama was Byron. He acted like nothing was going to happen, even though Mama got a bunch of our clothes together and put them in suitcases. The smelly green pine tree was hung from the rearview mirror and all the lists and figurings were done. But Byron acted like he didn't notice. Even after a few more yelling phone calls were made to Alabama, Daddy Cool just kept being cool. Byron didn't even get nervous when Mama packed a whole bunch of food in the giant green cooler we borrowed from the Johnsons. After all of this stuff, it was finally the night before we were supposed to leave. We just got in bed. Byron was up in his bunk and I was down in mine. I was so excited that I was talking a mile a minute, but I was talking to myself. Byron wouldn't answer or anything. There was a knock at the bedroom door. Come in. It was Mama and Dad. Mama said, lights out, Kenneth. Byron, you come with us. What for? We thought since this was the last night you were going to be spending in Flint for a while that you might like to sleep in our room tonight. You thought what? Byron had a way of saying stuff in a few words that made it seem like he was saying a whole bunch more. Come on, Bye. You're bunking with us tonight, Dad said. Oh, man. Byron jumped out of the top bunk and gave me his death stare. I just shrugged. I guess the grapevine had gotten back to Mama and Dad that Bob was going to make a prison break tonight before he got transferred to Alabama. He thought I was the snitch, but it was Joey. She knew if Mama and Dad got up in the morning and Byron had flown the coop that he'd really be a dead man when they finally recaptured him. So I guess she saved his life by snitching. But Bye sure didn't appreciate it. I sneaked out of bed after Mama and Dad arrested Byron. I was too excited to sleep and too excited to read. I looked out the window at the brown bomber and couldn't believe it was going to take us all the way to Alabama. The trip didn't become real to us until nine in the morning when we were in the car waving goodbye to Rufus and heading toward I-75, a road that runs all the way from Flint to Florida. One road. We weren't even on the expressway before Mama started reading out of her notebook, telling us everything that was planned for the next three days. Day one, today, we leave Flint and drive for 300 miles in about five or five and a half hours. That will take us to Cincinnati. 300 miles in one day? It just didn't seem like that could be done. Me and Joey shook our heads. Byron looked out the window. In Cincinnati, we'll get a room in a motel. We brought plenty of blankets so you kids will be able to sleep on the floor. Me and Joey cheered. We'd never been in a motel before. Byron just kept looking out the window. Day two, tomorrow. Now your daddy and this car both aren't as young as they used to be, so we don't want to push either one of them too hard. Dad looked shocked. So we rise and shine real early in the morning and drive for 250 miles in about five or six hours. That should put us right outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. 
Mr. Johnson says that there are some clean, safe rest stops there so we can spend the night in the car. If that's true, we'll stay there. If not, we'll have to see if we can find a motel room in Knoxville. Day three, Monday. This is going to be a tough day for your daddy because he's going to have to drive for more than six hours. After we leave Knoxville, we've got about 300 miles to go. If we leave early enough, we'll be pulling into home about three in the afternoon. Mama turned the page in her notebook. We're going to be able to stop once a day on the way down for hamburgers and once a day on the way back. Me and Joey cheered again at this news. Byron acted like he didn't hear. Now, if we sleep in the car outside Knoxville, we can stop one more bonus time that coming and going. Otherwise, the cooler in the trunk is full of chicken, soda pop, potato salad, sandwiches, and fruit for the whole trip down. I'm sure Grandma Sands will have everything set for the way back. I thought about it for a minute, then asked, Mama, how come we just don't drive until Dad gets tired and then stop? Dad did an imitation of a hillbilly accent. Cause boy, this hill is the deep south. You all's gonna be driving though. Y'all color folks can't be just pulling up to any old way or be expecting to get no room or no food. Yeah, boy, you hear, boy? I said, yeah, hear what I'm saying, boy? Me and Joey laughed again, and even Byron kind of smiled. This only encouraged Dad to say more Southern-style stuff. Y'all didn't know that, boy? What's the matter with you? You think this is America? Mama had everything planned about the trip. Everything. Where we'd eat, when we'd eat, who got bologna sandwiches on day one, who got tuna fish on day two, who got peanut butter and jelly on day three. She'd figure out how long we could hold ourselves between going to the bathroom, how much money we'd spend on hamburgers, how much was for any emergencies, everything. She figured out who'd get the windows on each day and who was responsible for keeping paper and junk from piling up in the car. When she finished reading all that stuff to us, I asked her if we could look at the notebook. She handed it to me, and I saw written on the cover in big black letters, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. She'd even drawn a picture of a flower with a big, fat, stupid bird trying to land on it. Man, Mama sure is a bad artist. Why is this bird trying to land on a flower, Mama? Dad cracked up. Ooh, Kenneth, I asked her the same thing, and she was highly offended. Mama said, that's a bee, not a bird. I guess if you squint it up your eyes, it might look like a bee, but not too much. Mama had also gone to the library to look up stuff about every state we travel through. We heard a bunch of boring junk about the expressway, how many years it took to finish it, how many miles long it was, how much it cost to build it, how it ran all the way from Upper Peninsula, Michigan to Florida. All kinds of thrilling news. The only thing that was a little bit interesting was how many people got killed and hurt making the road. You never would think putting an expressway down was so dangerous. She bought books and puzzles and games too. She really did try to make the trip interesting. The most interesting part for me though was going to be Byron. Two days before we left, Buphead came by to visit Byron. The three of us were in my and Bai's room. They tried to bully me out of the room, but I stayed. They were sitting in the upper bunk and I was in the lower one. Man, Buphead complained, I couldn't live with your old man. We'd be coming to blows daily, Jack. What can I say? Byron answered. Not much. I can't believe they're going to make you spend the whole blank summer in hot old Alabama. Shoot, I'd find somewhere else to stay. You're going to be black as the ace of spades when you get back. They some show enough sun down there. Yeah, but dig. I got a way to pay them jive old squares back. Yeah, what you going to do? I ain't even sure I'm going to go. But if I do, I know how they is. They going to try some of that Ozzy and Harriet TV show mess on the way down. You know, 
playing games and counting cows and guessing how many red cards we're going to see in the next two miles and all that kind of three, six, nine. But I'm ready for them. Yeah. Yeah. I got something that'll mess that junk up for all of them. What's that, daddy O? Byron remembered I was still in the lower bunk and stuck his head over the edge, then pointed at me. You say one word about this to anyone, I'm going to jack your little light head behind up. You hear? I said, oh, man. Bye disappeared back into the top bunk. Yeah, Buphead. If I do go, I'm going to go the whole blank trip. And no matter what they do to me, I ain't going to say one single word. Whoa. How long that trip going to take? Three days. Cool. That'll show them. They slapped palms and Bye said, yeah, you know it will. But as soon as we got to Detroit, Byron said, how are we going to work this record player? Dad looked in the rearview mirror and said to Bye, what do you mean? We going to take turns? Well, Byron, I don't think we'll be playing it for quite a bit yet. We can carry CKXW all the way down into Ohio. And they play some pretty good music. But when we do play it, we going to take turns? Sure. Cool. Am I first? Sure, we'll go by seniority. Dad was in the United Auto Workers at work, so seniority was real important in our house. Cool. I couldn't help myself. I leaned over Joey and said, kind of quiet to buy. I guess you really showed them, didn't you? Boy, they were really begging you to talk, weren't they, Daddy-o? Byron made sure Joey wasn't watching, then flipped me a dirty finger sign and made his eyes go cross. On the left, kids, is Tiger Stadium. Mama was pointing out all the important things we passed on the way. As the payback for giving me the dirty finger, I said out loud to Bye, How many cows you counted, Bye? How many red cars so far? He gave me his famous death stare, then leaned over Joey and whispered, No cars, no cows. But I counted your mama six times already. I couldn't believe it. What kind of person would talk about their own mama? I said, that's your mother too, stupid. I knew he didn't care though, but I had to get him back. So I called him the only thing that bothered him. I said, you might have counted my mama six times, but have you counted your mouth lately, lipless wonder? I got him. He showed his teeth and said, you little and try to grab me. Dad's eye was in the rearview mirror. All right, you two. I said, no nonsense. And I don't mean maybe. Byron used silent mouth language to say, I'm going to jack you up in Alabama, you punk. So as we drove down I-75, headed for Birmingham, I felt pretty good. Even though every time I looked at by, his eyes were crossed, I didn't care because this one time I bugged him more than he bugged me. And that's the end of chapter nine. Ooh, it's getting good. Tune in tomorrow for chapter 10. See you tomorrow.